the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Amen, we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hello and welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson and so glad to be with you today. Have with me B.J. Clark. B.J., always good to be with you as well. I agree. B.J., today we want to talk about security and our salvation. I know that there are a lot of people that when they talk about salvation, typically they will interject their feelings. And it's not uncommon to hear somebody say, you know, I just know in my heart that I'm saved. And, and sometimes I think whether they realize it or not, they're putting more emphasis on feelings mm -hmm. rather than the faith. So how do you counter those feelings as opposed to what the scriptures teach? You know, the proverb says uh, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end of that way is not salvation, it's death, Proverbs 14, 12. And that principle is so important that Proverbs 16.25 says the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then you think about this statement from Proverbs 12.15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Right. And remember in Judges 17.6 and 21.25, every man did what was right in his own eyes when there was no king in Israel. And then Proverbs 28.26 says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool not saved, it says, as you noted, a fool. And so our security and salvation is not based on a warm, fuzzy feeling sure. because we can be misled by our feelings. The Bible says that Jacob made this statement when he was shown the bloody coat of Joseph. He said, without doubt, That's right. Joseph is rent in pieces. Mm -hmm. He was as convinced of that as anyone ever could be. He cried as hard that Joseph was dead as if Joseph had actually been dead. And yet his feelings were based on something other than the true evidence. That's and right. so uh, if Jacob could get all emotional about something that wasn't really true, people today can get emotional about a salvation experience mm -hmm. that's not really true. Emotions don't tell the whole story. Now that's when right. we're saved, Mike, we'll be emotionally happy about sure. it but it's not going to be the, the real test of whether we're truly saved or not. Well, I think so. I think that there is an emotional aspect to obeying the gospel. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible talks about how they were pricked in their hearts. They were cut to the heart, and Peter you know, told them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then Luke tells us, with many other words, he testified and exhorted, saying, save yourselves from this crooked, untoward generation. And so there is this emotional aspect, but ultimately we have to be guided by truth. Mm -hmm. and, and the psalmist said, send out thy word, thy light. And, and the truth of God's word is what ultimately leads us unto salvation, isn't it? Right. Because as you know, uh, the Bible says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying, obeying the truth. The truth. Right. He didn't say, seeing you've purified your souls because you had a warm fuzzy feeling or you had a sensational experience or some kind of uh, chill running up and down your back. It's based on truth and John 8, 32 says you shall know the truth That's and right. it's the truth that makes you free. That's right. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught right. by God. Yes. Every man therefore that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. And so you can't take the scriptures out of that equation. Amen. Uh, B.J., I know that there are a lot of people in the world today that misunderstand God's plan of salvation. We talk about security, and many, many people in our world today believe that the plan of salvation is to accept the Lord Jesus into the heart. And sometimes they will say, you need to recite a certain prayer, the sinner's prayer. A and yet, in looking at the New Testament, I, I don't find those things. So how do you counter this wave of teaching that has become so prevalent in light of what Scripture teaches. All we can hope to do is create some noble Berean-like mentalities. You remember Acts 17 and verse 11 says something about those noble Bereans. And it, we often quote the part where they search the Scriptures 
daily to see whether these things were so, and that's important. But it's just as important their mind, their state of mind, and the attitude and the activity are important. Notice these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind. How ready are you and I to admit that we're wrong if someone could show us in this book that we're wrong? I'd like to think that I'm humble enough to say, look, if you can show me from this book right here where I'm wrong. In fact, we've said on this program, have we not, Mike, that if any of our viewers wanted to write us and say, look, you said this on the program, but you're wrong because the Bible says this, if they sent that to us, we would not be offended. Rather, we would Mm -hmm. investigate whether they were telling us the truth. The noble Bereans received the word with all readiness of mind, searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. This readiness of mind attitude reminds me of Cornelius Mm -hmm. in Acts 10, when Peter got to his house. I love what Cornelius said in verse number 33, and this ought to characterize all of us. He says to Peter, immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now watch this man's attitude. And he was a powerful man. Yes, he was. And yet a humble man. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. He has a readiness of mind yes, he does. to receive the truth. And he says, whatever God is telling you to tell us, tell us. That's right. We don't have our minds made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Mm-hmm. That's the way some people are. Well, and I think that's an important aspect. You, you talk about this readiness of mind, readiness of heart. In Luke chapter 8, when Jesus discussed the parable of the sower, one of the things he talked about was the heart receptive to his teaching. He said, it is comprised of a noble and good heart, an right. honest heart, a good heart. I remember hearing many years ago, I think it was Brother Franklin Camp. he said, you know, if a person doesn't have an honest heart, he or she can't be saved. No. And, and so the idea, as you said a moment ago, to say, look, this is what the text says, and because that's what it says, that's what I'm going to do. I, I remember hearing a story many years ago from a friend of mine. He said he was uh, discussing 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 with a gentleman, and he said during the course of their conversation, th- this gentleman did not believe he needed to be baptized into Christ. And so he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 1 Peter 3, verse 21. He said, I want you to read it, and then just tell me what it says. So he said the, the, the gentleman read the verse. And he said, uh, it says that baptism saves us. And then he turned right around and said, that's not what I believe. Well, it goes back to that honest and good heart, that noble and good heart. Are are we willing to put into practice what Jesus said? Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Right. When Jesus talked about the wise man hears the Word of God and does it. The foolish man hears it, doesn't do it. And the people that were secure in their salvation on the day of Pentecost were those who had heard the Word. They gladly received the Word, readiness of mind, and they were baptized, about 3,000 of them. And then it says they continued in the Apostles' Doctrine. Well, that implies that the Apostles' Doctrine had been the genesis of their beginning faith, but they continued in that. And so they had an attitude of, my security is not based on a warm, fuzzy feeling or an experience I had at the mourner's bench, That's right. it's rooted in Scripture, in the truth of God's Word, spoken or written. And <clears throat> think of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit mm-hmm. that we are the children of God. You talk about security. And there's a great book on this subject written by, I think, Sweeney. Yeah, it's a um, great book. And, uh, He writes on one side of the chart, here's what the Holy Spirit has said to Mm -hmm. do. And the Spirit bears witness, not to our spirit, but with our spirits. We look at what the Spirit said, and we say, check, I've done that. He says here, I've done that. Believe, I've done that. Repent, confess, be baptized, check, check, check. I've done everything that the Spirit says to do in this book. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. That's where my security is found in comparing what he yeah. said to do and whether I've done it. Checklist. I, I, think that's a great, I think that's a great illustration because you can go through the Scriptures, as you said a moment ago, and what the Holy Spirit has said about salvation, if you've complied with those fundamental things to do, then, then you're saved. If you haven't, 
then then you're not. Right. You know, in Acts chapter eight, just back backing up a couple of chapters, when Philip went down to the city of Samaria, the Bible says he preached Christ to those people. And, and if you look at what he preached the, to those people, the text says in verse 12 that they believed Philip as he preached things concerning the kingdom of God that would have to do with the church, the name of Jesus Christ that would have to do with his authority. And then the text says, speaking of their readiness of heart, readiness of mind, both men and women were baptized. So here were people that heard the truth of God, they believed it, they were receptive to it, and what happened? They were saved. Amen. That's right. So if we do what they did, won't we become what they were? Exactly right. And we can check it off and say, I have an example for how to be saved. But you see, quite frankly, the people who point to the thief on the cross as an example of how to be saved are really checking off apples and oranges comparisons, right. as we sometimes say. Because <clears throat> no one alive today lived under the same covenant the thief was living under when he was saved That's right. by Christ. Christ told him that uh, that day he would be with him in paradise, but Christ was alive yes, when he was. said that. Well, what difference does that make? Hebrews 9, a testament is a force after, after men are dead, That's right. and it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And so when people say, I'm going to be saved like the thief on the cross was saved, a couple of things jump out. One, Mike, it's not impossible that he had been baptized. That's right. Because he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus had not said anything about the kingdom while hanging on the cross that we have recorded in Scripture. But John preached about it. So where did, yes, John had been going everywhere preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, Matthew chapter 3, 1 and following. Jesus had said in his own preaching, Matthew, Matthew 4. 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people were being baptized right and left in anticipation of the coming kingdom. But even granting that the thief had never been baptized, that wouldn't change one thing about whether we need to be. That's right. Because uh, there are all kinds of examples of people saved before Christ died that lived under the Old Testament. We live under a different testament. Suppose you say to the IRS, I haven't paid my taxes in 25 years because George Washington the father of our country never paid a dime of income tax, so I won't either. They're going to laugh you out of the building because he lived in a time when the law was different. That's right. If he was alive today, George Washington or not, he'd be expected That's to right. pay income tax. And so you can drive over in Germany on the Autobahn as fast as you want. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be a defense when the police pull you over here sure. for driving that because you're under two different laws. And the thief was under one law, the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. We're under the law of Christ, and we have a different plan of salvation. Absolutely. Completely different era. And, and, and B.J., I, I remember years ago I was talking to Billy Garland Elkins, and we were discussing salvation on, on a television program, I think. And, and I never will forget asking him about the thief on the cross because so many people bring that up. And, and his response was, well, what about the thief on the cross? Mm -hmm. and, and then he went back, as you did, and talked about the fact that it could have been the case he was baptized according to the baptism of John based on Matthew chapter 3. And then you mentioned Jesus preaching the kingdom, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, there was a change of covenants. Matthew, or rather Hebrews chapter 9, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And then in Mark chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking, as you said, about apples to apples. It's, it's apples and oranges. Right. We ought to be asking, what about the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost? What about the Ethiopian eunuch right. in Acts 8? What about the Philippian jailer in Acts 16? What about Lydia and her household in Acts 16? And just on down, what about Saul the Corinthians in Acts 18? Saul of Tarsus, who was praying and was, the preacher Ananias was told, Behold, he prayeth, Acts 9-11. Mm -hmm. You're looking for the praying man. When he gets to him, he says, Get up. That's right. He doesn't say, Hey, stay right there and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Forgive me. No, none of that. Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. Now, you can have security when you know that you've done exactly what the Bible says to do, but there's no security in following after the doctrines and commandments of men, which are always in the plural when Jesus is describing 
uh, the doctrines and commandments of men because unfortunately there's so many of them. But the doctrine singular of Christ is a unit of teaching that hasn't changed That's exactly since right. the day He gave it. That's exactly right. PJ, I know that when we talk about security and salvation, there, there are a couple of extremes. On, on the one hand, you have some people that say, you know what, once you become a child of God, you can never fall from grace. The flip side of that is some would say that, well, I just don't feel secure in my salvation. Right. And, and they, have this they have this attitude, this mindset that, okay, one day I'm saved, the next day I'm lost, the next day I'm saved. And, and so it's like a pendulum. And, and so there has to be a balance there, obviously. Right. And, and so how do you counter these two extremes? I think Jesus gave us a great statement in John 10 that balances that. Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a radio preacher quote, and I say that in quotes, quote this passage by saying, Jesus said, my sheep will never perish, and they'll have eternal life, and no man will pluck them out of my hand. Jesus' sheep will never perish, and they skip over the two components of the type of sheep that Jesus is addressing. In verse 27, my sheep, one, hear my voice. What if I quit hearing or listening to the command of Christ? Two, I know them and they follow me and I give unto them. The them of verse 28 points back to the sheep described in verse 27. Try Not just any sheep not a wayward sheep, not a rebellious sheep. And by the way, one of the greatest books I ever read to help me appreciate what it is to be a sheep um, is written by the man who a shepherd looks at Psalm 23. Mm -hmm. And he described how sheep are often some, sometimes so obstinate to go their own way For instead sure. of following the shepherd because they think they know where the better pasture is or where the better water is. They need to trust their shepherd. We have a shepherd who will always lead us in the right way. And it's simply inconsistent to say that uh, we can do whatever we want and still be saved. One more thing. You mentioned the other extreme, those who say once saved, never quite sure thereafter. Mm -hmm. These people are told in verse 28 that as long as you are one of the sheep that hear my voice and follow me, as long as you're doing that, you'll never perish. That's right. No man will pluck you out of the Father's hand. You have eternal life. You don't have to worry about it. First John 5, 13. Well, you know, I was just thinking about First John just a minute ago as you were talking. And in First John chapter 1, verse 5, John said, This is a message which we've heard from Him and declare to you that God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. He said, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, in other words, we walk outside of harmony with His will, we're, we're not walking mm -hmm. in cadence with His Word, He said, We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Over in chapter 2, in verse 3, here's the litmus test, as you mentioned a moment ago. By this we know that we know Him. Well, how do we know that we know Him? If we keep His commandments. Mm -hmm. Exactly what Jesus said in John chapter 10. Right. Exactly. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Well, how do I know if I'm in the will of God? Am I following His commands? Verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. We live a consecrated life. We, we live a Christ-like life. Mm -hmm. and, and if we do that, then we know that we're following in his will, in his footsteps. That's right. Uh, B.J., you mentioned 1 John chapter 5. And uh, again, this whole idea, there, there are some people even, sadly, there are people that have been members of the body of Christ for many, many years, and, and they, they don't feel secure in their salvation. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to the Scriptures. You cited a moment ago, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And so if I take this book and line it up with my life, and James uses the, the picture of a mirror, if I look into the mirror of God's Word, and, and if I'm doing what God has said to do, then I'm in good standing. But in 1 John chapter 5, John said, this is a testimony, this is a witness that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. If we're not in the Son, we don't have life. Exactly right. In verse 12, he said, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Look, it doesn't take an Einstein to understand. If you're not in Christ, you don't have life. Right. But then in verse 13, he said, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. 
K-N-O-W. Well, why did they write? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by, by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Well, if I take what He has written, and if my life harmonizes with that, then can I know I have eternal life? Absolutely. John said we could. What about Paul? You know, Paul is a tremendous case study. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said, For we know mm -hmm. that if the earthly house, this tabernacle, this tent be dissolved, he said, We have a building of God, a house not made with hands. How did he know that? Right, absolutely. Based on the revelation of God's Word, he knew how he became a Christian, and he knew how he was going to die as a faithful Christian. And he said, The time of my departure is at hand. He didn't have a doubt. He said, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. That's right. And he also knew, Paul, since you mentioned him, that someone even as, as great as he was could fall if he wasn't careful That's because right. he wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Wherefore I buffet my body and keep it under subjection, lest by any means after I have preached to others I myself should be cast away. It's a word that means rejected, a dis, it's a banking term that refers to in the Greek world something that's disapproved. Mm -hmm. And Paul thought that he, after all the sermons he'd preached, the souls that he'd saved, the fact that his own soul had been saved, he thought that he possibly could be rejected. That's right. And he went on right after that and said in 1 Corinthians 10, the children of Israel were God's children, but they fell in the wilderness. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands Take heed lest he fall. That's right. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. And he says that right on the heels of these things were written for our admonition. There's something you and I need to learn from looking at Old Testament Israel. God's covenant people can be disinherited, Numbers That's 14, true. 12. They can fall. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned John a moment ago, 1 John 5, 13. We can know we have salvation, but in the very next epistle, 2 John, he said, look to yourselves that we lose There's not, not right. those things which we've wrought, but that we receive a full reward. John says, don't blow it. Don't lose it. Make sure you keep it. And it's possible to do that. We don't have to be unfaithful. Well, certainly. As a matter of fact, in 1 John 5, 13, John said, these things I've written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Right. Back in chapter 3, there is a contrast between those who practice righteousness and those who practice unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. Not saying it's impossible for a child of God to sin, but he's saying that, that somebody who is practicing, that is, who's walking in the light, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, who is continuing to believe in the name of the Son of God, that person has life. In 1 John chapter th uh, 2, verse 28, he said, And now, little children, abide in Him. Didn't Jesus talk about abiding in Him in John chapter 8? That mm -hmm. when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. He said, if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Exactly right. So as a child of God, we're a practitioner, practitioner of righteousness. We're walking in the light. We're walking in harmony with the will of God. You know, in 1 John 5, 16, there's a passage that's often been misinterpreted to suggest there's some particular sin that's unpardonable and that uh, we've got to avoid committing that specific sin. But the real point of 1 John 5, 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not unto death. Well, how do we make sense of that? In 1 John 1, 7, you've already noted that if we confess our sins, 7 and following, verse 9, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, He's faithful and just to, to forgive us. us our sins and to cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. And so if this brother is sinning a sin that's not unto death, the reason it's not unto death is because he's confessed it and God will cleanse him if he confesses it. Uh, now, we should pray for him because He's committing a sin, but he's having a penitent attitude. That's right, that's right. But if someone says they're going to commit sin, stay in sin, we should not pray for them to be forgiven in their sinfulness. Because they're not going to be forgiven. Jesus said, if a man repent, let, that he can be forgiven, you that's know, right. Luke 17. And so, 1 John 5, 16 is not as complicated as some make it. Pray for the brother that's willing to repent of his sins. He will be forgiven. The brother who's 